Stefani Rabikoff. I'm pleased to bring you a special feature this week on In the Kitchen. We're calling it At Home for the Holidays. So I've invited you into my home to share a family tradition for the holidays. It is potato pancakes. We call them latkes. And to help me with this signature dish is my mom. Also helping me with this dish is the production team that helps to bring you in the kitchen each week. You don't see them, but this show would not happen without them. They are the shooters, the editors, the graphic designers, the web producers that make In the Kitchen come to you on the multimedia platforms. We're also going to be talking to a chef from the Food TV Network, that is Tyler Florence. He has invited us into his studio kitchen in California to help contribute to this special feature. Tyler, thank you for joining us. You are the ultimate chef on the Food TV Network. What is your inspiration for making that happen? So, so what we do is when, when we pick a, a specific topic for a show, um, we, 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 do some, we do some research and, and to not really make it where it feels um, silly, right? But it feels like the classic, right? And why is that so fantastic and delicious? So we kind of dive into um, a lot of, lot of some history and you know, maybe a little bit of technique and kind of give people uh, what I think is what they want. And that's, a, that's a, a, a great concept, you know, one or two cooking steps and you get a masterpiece out of that. And then, and then it's just been one of the kind of fun things because it, it's a, it gives people a very, very specific goal to go to. We are in the holiday season and we know that side dishes can really help make a meal memorable. What do you suggest for our audiences? Absolutely. So as far as like side dishes for the holidays specifically, one of my favorite holiday classics and, and my family um, uh, are very clear about this. I'm not invited unless I bring this, right? They just, they're, they're very, very clear about that position, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, baked sweet potatoes. It's a sweet potato and banana souffle, right? It's, it's, it's killer, right? So uh, uh, sweet potatoes in the oven. You want to take a fork and make sure you put some holes into it so they don't explode. And then uh, so maybe six to eight medium-sized sweet potatoes will give you uh, a, plenty, a great side dish for about a dozen people, right? So Tyler, when you put the sweet potatoes in the oven, do you wrap them in foil first or do you just put them in undressed? You know what, yeah, to me the, the, the foil I don't think really does anything specifically to that, right? So, so with, with the baked potato, you just want to make sure you pop some holes in it so the steam inside the moisture, uh, the moisture inside the potato has some place to go and it doesn't erupt, right? Because uh, that, that can be embarrassing, it's happened to me quite a few times. So, so, so you want to put them on a sheet pan and you want to cook them for, you know, for the better part of an hour. Sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's an hour and 10. So eight, eight good medium potatoes, I'm going to say probably probably two bananas, right? So you're gonna take the bananas and just plop them on with the skin and everything on the same sheet pan as, as the sweet potatoes as, as well. And then you just wanna bake them all together, right? So, so, um, so the whole hours pass through. You know, when the potatoes are cool enough to handle, peel them, scoop them out, and put them into a food processor, and then also some bananas. And then you wanna, you wanna just kinda of puree the two together, right? Get ready. This, is, this will be a flavor that will haunt you for the rest of your life. It's so, it's, it's beyond marvelous. Tiny bit of salt, a little bit of honey, tiny bit of vanilla, and then a little bit of sweet spice. You can add some, you can add some, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of orange zest if you want to, as long as it kind of hits that right note. So it's gotta be, so you got the base flavor, and then you wanna, you wanna give it some aroma, right? So it definitely needs some salt as a balance. A little bit of vanilla is very specific on top of that. A little bit of honey is a really good call. You know, I, I put maple syrup in it before. So you can, there's a little bit of room to play around with, which is fantastic. And then, and then uh, so, so that puree uh, goes into a casserole dish. And then you want to make a very simple pecan streusel on top of that as well, right? So it's a little bit, so it, it's, um, it's um, uh, three parts uh, flour to one part butter. And the butter needs to be cold. And you want to kind of work that together as a paste and then chopped up toasted pecans fold it into that with a little bit of salt. That's gonna go on top of this, and then you bake the whole thing off, all right? So it, it's, uh, it's like my sweet potato banana casserole uh, with pecan streusel. Get ready to rumble. Tyler, thank you for joining us in the kitchen and sharing your inspiration with us. And now I'd like to introduce you to one of my inspirations, my mom. 
So now it's time to meet my mom, my inspiration, original inspiration in the kitchen. I'd like for you to meet my mother, Ida Moore. Hello, nice meeting all of you. In fact, I find this quite exciting. Okay, so mom, all right. You've been cooking for many years. I mean, every Hanukkah as I was growing up was in our home. Yes. And now it's in my home with my son, your grandson. And so oh, he, yes, yes, he's too bad you don't care for him more. Um, so Hanukkah, what is it the celebration? It's a celebration of? Freedom, the okay. idea that you can have your own religion, that you can have your way of life you want to lead and not have someone tell you that this is the way you have to do it. And so yeah. why do we do it with light? Because light is what ha happened when they finally got back, when they were attacked by the Assyrians and the Greeks, they... Uh, they, the Israel in what year? Ju 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 Judea, Judea back called. then, yes. What Judea, year? and they were 2,500 years ago? 2,500 years, years ago. ago. And you find that they, these were not people that were warriors that went out to fight them. They were plain everyday neighbors who said, we can't live like this. We don't want to live like this. So they formed a guerrilla band. Mm -hmm. And that's how they attacked. They couldn't fight a, a, an army that was mechanized and had that many men. They were few. We celebrate for eight days because once we reclaimed the temple, which had been defiled. Oh, terrible. There was only enough oil to burn the candelabra that was in there for one day and our miracle was that it lasted eight days. They just uh, celebrated every one of those days and they decided that they were going to do this from now on. We shall never forget that this happened to us. They did this. Like I said before, in the Hebrew language, the most important verb is least core, to remember. Okay, so we remember the fact that um, we reclaimed our temple, that the light, the eternal light, which represents God, was able to continue burning until that they could manufacture oil to, uh, fresh oil to burn the eternal light. And our celebration is two things. One, the oil that we fry the potato pancakes in, but it is also the food that gave strength to Ju Judah Maccabee and his brothers and those are potato pancakes. That's right. They they got got together and they were, by taking the potatoes and and grating them up and putting onion in it and eggs and then them frying it in this oil. They could get the meal done fast. Mm -hmm. Even for a roast and oven takes a long time. But this way, they I, that that was sustenance kept them going. That's one of the things there. That's the nice part, and that's when you have your family over, you have your meal, you have your potato lot because everybody eats. But then there's another part to it too. Yeah. We play a game called dreidel. We have a couple of those here, only these are more decorative, but the dreidel is a great, well, not just for children. In our family, everybody plays dreidel. We play dreidel. Potato lock is, yeah. We do that, and what it is, it has a symbols on it. Nes kadol hayashon. A great miracle happened there. Some people do do it for money, but it, it is just a way to remember um, how precious freedom is and that we still celebrate it. You know, they say if you pay attention to your history, you can make good decisions about how to well, live you your hope future. They, make it. they could just remember not to let these things happen again. You have to remember so that everything will not happen again. At least we try not to let it happen again. Okay, by remembering the past. so. Potato lock is our huge favorite in our family. Oh. And I think that you and I should go into the kitchen and I think we should make some potato lock is for our production team um, that is you know my extended way? family. Yes, yeah. and the thing is the way you eat them really is when they come out of the frying pan you stand there and eat them. Yes, well. You don't get to the plate half the time. <laughs> We have usually, potato lock if you go the down family. the line and somebody grabs one and before you know you're lucky to get the table with two or three latkes on the plate. Okay. That's the way they do it. But they, All right, so I think you and I should go in the kitchen and I'm with potato lock is. I know, and I think you should come with us. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rapikoff, and I am pleased to invite you to a special feature on In the Kitchen, in my home. We are celebrating our traditions, sharing them with you, and to do that, I have my mom, 
Ida Moore with me and also the production team for In the Kitchen with Bonnie. Starting on my right, we have Jenna Holloway. Jen is our editor. Then next to Jen is Mark Groves, and he's the Director of Creative Services at Intercom Radio. Moving on around the island is our designer, Veronica Houghton. Veronica does graphics and web production, and she rolls her eyes when we're late with the video. <laughs> she can do that very, very well. And then we have cinematographer Kevin Bryce. Kevin does the shooting, he does editing as well. And so we're all gonna be in the kitchen to help bring you this special feature for at home for the holidays. Okay, mom, where do we begin? Where do we begin? We have to begin with the potatoes. They have to be clean, cut up, and ground, and the onions. Okay, we have two very able-bodied people to help Fine. do that. And you know, while they're begin chopping, I'm going to talk about what we're doing for the condiments for our potato latkes or potato pancakes. And Veronica and Kevin are doing that. So Kevin is in charge of applesauce. In our family, it had traditionally been sour cream with some chives on it. Yep. But there are many households that prefer baked apples or applesauce traditionally with some cinnamon and sugar. Great. So I know, Kevin, that you can do the applesauce with the cinnamon and sugar, two parts sugar to one part cinnamon. We are using a Vietnamese cinnamon, which, which is It seriously? smells pretty yeah, incredible. It's, it's pretty incredible. It yeah. And I should tell you that all of these products here are oh, for such a good organic that, brand. It's an organic it's brand. brand. Yeah. And we do organic, and we do organic sour cream as well because um, we don't want antibiotics, growth hormones, steroids in our milk products. No, you Sorry. all are busy doing this, and we're gonna get the potato lock is ready to go into the frying pan. Great. Okay, guys. So, Mom, we've got white onions, and we've got Yukon gold potatoes, and you know in this household they're all organically grown. And Mark is chopping away here. What's the ratio? We've got five pounds of potatoes, so how many onions do you think you're gonna want in here? A lot of times it depends upon the size of the onion. Okay. If it's a huge onion, you may need one or one and a half. Okay, so we so should... look like pretty big onions here, and uh, you have another one over here, let's see. Well, so should we get going with this I and then see I if you want the more? I think I start the potatoes. Okay, well, down Jen, down you're, you're on the You could put a potato and a piece of onion, a potato and a piece of onion that way. Okay. All right, go for it, girl. So, um, how am I going to use this one? I think you're just going to press on and see what okay. happens. Or you can do this little presser thing. Okay. okay. Is that the consistency that you want, Mom? Yeah, that's me, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going, okay. So we're kind of alternating the potato and the onion in like that, make it a little easier to mix it up. See, if we had all these people helping us for Hanukkah, <laughs> we'd be doing this. Or you guys have to come back for the Hanukkah celebration. I do I have a job. <laughs> you got a job. There's a future. We did not peel these potatoes. They've been scrubbed, and they are organic. Okay, so, oh, we are really nice and full. This is a serious... Take these pieces out. Okay. These pieces get to go away. And this is the part where we retain all the fingers on our hand and pull that out separate. And you know what? I'm going to grab this. It doesn't grind it to mash. What it does in your hands are your best. Look how dry, good, great and dry that is. The blade is out so I can put my hand here. We, in our family, we prefer to have a pretty good sized grate on there so it almost has a hash brown texture to it. So now joining us, because he was behind camera earlier, is Frank Gote. He also is a cinematographer, shooter, editor for In the Kitchen with Bonnie. Thank you for coming here and helping us with potato lock is okay. My mother is the executive chef, and so she's going to direct you on how to prepare this for the potatoes and the onions that we have grated. Okay. Okay, Sounds so good. what do we need to add to this mixture? I think see another egg. Another egg. Okay. I beat you. I did two of them for you. Oh, thank She's you. Just showing how to do it. Okay. I beat those up real good. And you know, one of the things that is helpful about, and normally we would use a fork for this, but 
is I think when you mix the other ingredients up prior to putting the potatoes and onions in, you get a more consistent mixture. Now, in our family, we also like to add green onions because we like to see specks of that in the potato okay, loaf. Yes. Are we all chopped? Yeah, we are. Okay. You can chop them up good. Yes, we did. We had a good chopper over there. How much baking powder do we have in we have here? I have a half a teaspoon. Okay. Okay, half a teaspoon of baking powder. Oh, and that what makes them kind of fluffy. Yeah. Now, do you want to add the flour yet, or is not it... until I get the potatoes? Okay. Done. All right, and I use you know my kitchen tools, my hands, which are immaculately clean, and I had them before you know we had kitchen. Very good, Frank. I had no idea that your skills went into the kitchen. <laughs> We're going to need more eggs. We can do more eggs. Now, why are you saying that? Why are you believing that we're going to need more eggs? Again, this is about five pounds of potatoes. Yes, but you need the eggs to help hold more of that together. OK, That's and the right. flour does that, too. A little bit. You don't want it to taste like flour. You want it to taste no, like potatoes. Absolutely. So this is um, I'm using salt right now. sea salt. And I get it in the granules. It's harvested. This one's harvested, I think, off okay, now put some pepper France. In. And these are black peppercorns. You can get a mixture of peppercorns, but the black peppercorns really give you some punch here. I know you love the little shaker. It's such a personality of its own. I'm salting your hands, which I think would be delicious. We'll just chew on them. You've done that often mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, too. we have. Okay. All right. So the team has gotten the sides ready, our condiments for the potato latkes, and we have chopped and cuisinart the onions, the potatoes. We've added eggs to them. We've added green onions, salt, and pepper to taste. And now we have two frying pans going. I'd like to talk about it. This frying pan has canola oil in it because Veronica's allergic to peanuts. And for those of you who have a nut allergy, then we use canola oil. This is traditionally fried in peanut oil, and so this one has peanut oil in it. Now, what we did first was we got the pans warm. And then once the pans were warm, and you can tell that by putting your hand about five inches above the frying pan, if you can feel the heat, you're there. And then we added the oil. And mom always puts a little drop of the potato latke mixture in to see if it sizzles. This is what you want. You don't want to scorch them, but you want these little bubbles around here to happen. And mom right. makes her potato latkes elongated. I'm having a memory of grandma, my grandmother, my mother's mother who was born in 1903. So this happened to her when she was around five years old, which means it was, a, it was over 100 years ago. And her mother it was Hanukkah. She grew up in Cleveland. She did come over from Europe. She grew up in Cleveland, and it was the dead of winter, and her mother was making potato latkes, and she wanted one. Well, here she was in all of her little snow clothes. She couldn't come into the house, so she took an icicle off the house, and her mother put the potato lock on the icicle, and she ate the potato lock on the icicle. And every time Grandma made potato lockers, she would tell me that story. And another Grandma story is that when she was um, coming over to America, going through Ellis Island, because we brought all these traditions with us wherever we go, um, she was maybe around three-ish, and she was up on deck, and it was cold, and so they had a blanket on her. Well, the blanket was itching her because it was wool, and my uncle told her if she didn't stop complaining, he was going to throw her in the ocean. So good thing she stopped complaining. Unfortunately, we're all still allergic to wool, but we have our potato lockers. She brought that with her over through Ellis Island. I'm surprised at how many people know chachi in a chutzpah, and they even say it correctly. This is a test. I know Mark can say chutzpah. Chutzpah. See, look at that. I know. Chutzpah. He's going to grow up to be a nice <laughs> Jewish boy. <laughs> because he can say chutzpah. So these potato latkes, people are now making them with zucchini. They're using the same concept by grating sweet potatoes. But this is, this is tradition. And I should say it's a tradition of the Ashkenazic 
Jew, who is more the European Jew. The Sephardic Jew is more the Hispanic Mediterranean, and they don't eat potato pancakes. Poor things. <laughs> but they do. They eat uh, donuts. jelly donuts. Yeah, jelly donuts. So it's still fried in oil. And you all are going to smell like potato lock is for days. <laughs> it permeates the air. Your clothes. My aunt used to put her coat in the kitchen so it would smell like potato lock is for a week, <laughs> which I think is a bit much, but it made my aunt happy. So. She puts up with all of us, so there you go. Oh, that was uh, Ooh, maybe not yet. Yeah. 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 You know what you do? Okay, here's yeah. you take a little peek under before and then it tells yeah. you. It okay. it has to tell you though. Nope. That baby's not that ready. Side, but... no. I don't want to cook your pie. That's, uh, I don't want to cook your pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to. You have to fly down good. There it is. Tricks of the trade. Oh, no. Okay, we are still cooking potato lockers, pancakes, and it's time to plate before all of our celebrity tasters. That would be the production team for In the Kitchen with Bonnie. Taste this food. So here we go. I should tell you that the potato lockers, once we fried them, are put on a, a grid, if you will, and put into the oven to stay warm. And while they are warm, they don't get soggy because they have the opportunity to drain. Okay. Yep, that's how you do it. Okay, here we go. Now, who else do we want to go on here? This little guy here wants a home. Now, again, traditionally, we serve this with two condiments, if you will. One is the sour cream, and in our family, we always add chives to our sour cream and another condiment is applesauce and Kevin one of our cinematographers added some cinnamon and sugar and I know people that actually do both so from our home to yours happy Hanukkah We have been in the kitchen in my home for a special feature at home for the holidays. And the special feature has included my mom, who's helped us make our traditional food, potato latkes, and the entire production team of In the Kitchen with Bonnie. So now, our usual segment, the celebrity taste testing, and they are our celebrities. Guys, dig in. I've already been picking on this. I want to sour cream myself. That's how we were brought up. Our our customs were the sour cream. Mm -hmm. I didn't think the uh, applesauce would work, but it's actually pretty good. I thought, you know, the onions and, mm -hmm. and all of that, it wouldn't. Are these your fruit? Who's had potato latkes before? Just once. What? As long as your mom will come over and tell me how to do it. Mom, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a time for family and for friends and for sharing the holidays with each other. and. Again, you are my extended family, and I so appreciate all the hard work that you do. I was and amazed at all of you. You're all pretty young and pretty wonderful. <laughs> and you catch on pretty quick. You're not sabbing around. <laughs> I think so, too. I do. I want to thank you all for for everything that you do all year long, and, and especially for sharing this, um, this holiday and time with me. And to Mom for passing down the tradition, which I'm now passing on to my son and continuing the tradition of our people and our ethnicity and part of that is sharing it. So that's what we do. That's what Hanukkah is all about. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and once again we are in the cellar with Marquis Selections and their managing director Chris Cribb. Thank you once again for inviting us into your cellar. Sure, Bonnie. Great to be in the cellar with you. Okay, so Marquis Selections. 
How did it all begin? Well, we got started uh, back in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, we were looking for a project to work uh, with a sister company uh, out of Australia and found a number of small vineyards that um, couldn't uh, export to the United States by themselves. Mm -hmm. So. We started up a business plan and from scratch uh, put together a portfolio of Australian wineries and uh, began importing them into the United States uh, under our brand name Marquee, Marquee yes. Australian Wines. And after a number of years of growing that business, we felt like we were ready to start replicating the model and move to uh, areas of Argentina, Italy, Spain, Portugal. We've moved to sustainably focused, organic, uh, small producers. So we went where we were looking at the wine world and yes. thought there are beautiful wineries in every part of the country, um, in the United States, in the rest of the world, but uh, these that all have the sustainable green focus, we feel like they really take care of their wines oh, and put sure. extra into the, uh, the production of the wines uh, and are giving back. And, and are giving back. That, so uh, really helps our commitment to them. Began in Australia and then using that selection process for these unique vineyards and great winemakers. I know they all are very passionate about the wine that they produce. Absolutely. And, they, now, and now taking great care to make sure we're getting more organic and sustainably grown grapes. Yes, and, and at value prices. I, that's and the other thing that we, prices. you know, we really put down as one of our three mandates is great wines, great prices, and um, and green focused. It is the season. It is the for season. us to gather around. Yeah, oh, there we I go. Had to do it once. I know yeah. you did, and you did it well, oh, Chris. Okay. So we're going to go to tailgating parties, or we're going to be entertaining while we're watching our favorite team. What should we drink with this, this entertainment? I think that you're wanting to try to find something that's gonna please a lot of different flavors, right. because these are not the same flavors that you get when you're making rich sauces and things. You're doing a lot more charring of the, the, the food on the grill, so. So grilling's king. I, even if it's January, you're gonna go out on the grill for occasions like this. So we're talking sure. about grilled foods. And, so so and when you think of the grill, yes. the grill puts that, um, puts that uh, coating on the outside mm -hmm. of it. You know, I mean, it mm -hmm. really, um, really kind of encapsulates the flavor is the way I like to think of it. Mm -hmm. And so what you're trying to do is you want to pair something that's going to go well with okay. what's encapsulated in there. Um, I chose for you a couple wines today that I think are very versatile for um, for a couple different areas. Mm -hmm. The first is a uh, Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc blend from oh. Mont, Italy. Okay. So well, we love Italy. Yes, we yes, love we it. do. We mm -hmm. love Italy. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc mm -hmm. is uh, the lighter white grape. Interesting. Yes. Uh, it okay. is kind of known for being a little more gooseberry, a little more tart. And this one is paired with Chardonnay, which makes it a little longer in its palate, mm -hmm. uh, a little more green apple type of a flavor. Uh, interesting together, I think it just makes it a really bright wine that goes with a lot of different things. So really versatile, especially for a white wine. Yes, yes. absolutely. Hey, could be a, an aperitif at a party, but mm -hmm. it also could stand up to you know a big hefty salad. Could go with like a, um, you know, when I'm thinking things on the grill, a grilled chicken breast, mm -hmm. you know, this would be great with uh, something like some shrimp skewers, kebabs, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know the flavor profile that you get into there, it's got that citrus to it. I just have to mention that I, I think it's a great recipe. Do it a little ahead of time, a white bean chili. That's perfect. You know, something that's a little... And this would be perfect with that, white bean chili. So you can make it up ahead of time. You don't have to be in the kitchen and just have it ready to go. Yeah, you, you can enjoy the time there. You don't have to be trying to cook around a little stove. You just be able to go plug it in and you're, you're in ready your to go. In your business. Yep. Okay, all right, so we've got those items covered for the tailgate. Now yep. what else do we have and why? Well, so I would say the other two components that would go in my cooler okay. is probably, there might be a six pack of beer in there. there that's I, very possible. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, a nice, nice cold beer goes mm -hmm. good at a tailgate. Mm -hmm. But I also like red wine. Okay. And um, so I chose another versatile red wine. All right. This is a blend. This okay. is the Rio Real Reserva. This is a blend of Syrah, mm -hmm. Torriga Nacional, and Tinto Rorris. And 
not familiar with those other grapes. So what's the flavor profile okay, here? Sure. Well, we'll take them and break it down a little okay. bit. Okay. Syrah, the first part, is okay. Shiraz. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a little bit more of a spicy, medium to heavy red grape. Right. The Tariga Nacional is one of the grapes, and this is a Portuguese wine. Okay. It's one of the grapes that is used in making fortified port wines. So it's a little bit of a darker, deep, dark raspberry, blueberry flavor. Because mm -hmm. uh, Portugal, you think of port, so yes. we imagine that might be in there. So, mm -hmm. so it kind of has that little bit of that essence of port mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And then Tenta Roriz is also um, in Spain called Tempranillo, and it is uh, the largest grown grape in Spain. Mm -hmm. Tempranillo is a softer red. I would encourage people to try Tempranillo, especially people that want to try red wines that have been a little you know, intimidated really about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tempranillo is a great grape because it is uh, softer, it's a little more approachable, it doesn't have as high of tannins. Um, when you look at the color profile that it brings in, it's all, it almost gets a little bit into that light red rust where mm -hmm. kind of Pinot Noir gets mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so in this blend, you see the lightness of the Tempranillo at the end, you see the darkness of the Triga Nacional in the middle, and the Syrah, the peppery stuff at the front. So, And isn't that interesting? Wouldn't have thought of blending that, but of course Portugal did. And should you have cheeses included in your tailgate? Absolutely. You know, you this, got your cover. This would be a great, great blend for that as well. And I think What if you did barbecue? Could you do this, this with this? Was, it would go really well with barbecue, barbecue. because of that smoky flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, but. I would go burgers. I think this would oh, be sure. just, you know great with a with a burger with a little barbecue sauce on it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna do something like ribs, mm -hmm. you know this has got a little bit of that um, stuff that can handle some of the, the fattiness of a rib. So, uh, so you're you're going to this tailgate, which means you're going to have to transport these wines. Yeah. How do we do that and maintain the integrity of the flavor of the wine? Sure. Well, I think the um, the easiest thing. If you're bringing food yes. to the tailgate as well, or, or if you just get the wine, um, is to put these on ice. Okay. Go ahead and put them on ice beforehand so that they are chilled when you get there. You Including uh, your red. Including your red. Including your red. People drink red a little too warm. And when you, when, especially when you're starting to do and pair up with things like you know, a, a spicy barbecue sauce, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if your red is too hot, that wine will taste spicy and it tastes... Alcoholish all, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's Probably a term they call hot. Hot. It'd be hot. Right. Um, it's not a good thing. Not going to work. You usually okay. want to be hot, but not this time. No, okay. No, <laughs> we won't do that. So we put the wines on ice and we'll want to serve the red a little warmer than the white, but still it needs to come from that chilled yeah. place. And, and, you know, I think that at that, in this type of a situation, there's some great plastic glasses that uh, plastic right. acrylic wear that you Crystal can... Crystal might not work yeah. here. No. I would probably keep that at home. Okay, so, we'll keep so it at you home. can have something nice uh, for another day. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the other thing that I find, there's a couple, you look at all the little tools that they have that you can buy mm -hmm. um, for a, a wine connoisseur. Okay. One that is a unique toys. one. They're wine yes. toys. Wine toys. <laughs> there's one called a Venturi that uh -huh. is a an aerator. So if you have a wine that is, say, a, a bigger wine, um, like a Cabernet that needs to breathe, mm -hmm. you were thinking about decanting it, but you're going to something you don't want to... Can't decant. This yeah. would be a great spot. You put the aerator, you pour the wine through the aerator, makes a little whistling sound. Yep. And no, it's, it's coming. got there you extra go. air in it. It's just reminding our viewers that reds, especially one like this, or maybe a little older red, is going to need some air to do what it, it needs is. to do. It, okay. it just, if not, it'll not taste as as fruity as full, um, and you want uh, that, that better okay. impact. Okay, so we know how to transport it. and. Um, you all have won some spectacular awards for the care that you take in creating this portfolio. How have you done that? And I should say from Wine Spectator, which is... Well, we, we, uh, we thank Wine Spectator and um, I appreciate Others, you, yeah. um, you mentioning that uh, we have really looked at trying to find that great value for our money. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we found that some regions of the world are we find it better than others okay. at producing that, um, you know, how far your dollar can go. Yep. The countries that are having a little bit of a problem over in the EU these days. Okay. You know, the... Uh, Several of the, them are, but yeah, yes. the, okay. the, But the, the fact of the matter is your U.S. dollar goes further there. It, it goes does. further down in Argentina, which we also import from. And, Wonderful. you know, what we, what we found is that 
by focusing on getting the best value, knowing who you're, you're importing from or who you're buying as a consumer, you're able to find someone you can trust. And that's, that's really what... You, you've done that for us. You've gone there, you've gone to the winemakers, you've been to the vineyards, and so it, it is wonderful to know that there is a portfolio out there that's been cared for the way you've cared for Marquis. Thank you. Sure, thank, thank you. you. If you're looking for something that's a good value for the money, Marquis is a, is a great spot to start. There we go. So, Marquis.com or one 888 Marquee yeah. will get you all connected. Yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me once again into your cellar. Sure, it's great to uh, share some, some tailgate time here <laughs> with you okay, and okay. Uh, um, give you a couple tips for the next time that we're going out. Okay. Um, so hopefully that we can uh, get a few more of our friends following us on Facebook and Twitter mm -hmm. and talking all about in the cellar and in the kitchen. <laughs> in the kitchen. Cheers. Cheers.